Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, and gentlemen, colleagues, if you wish, you can speak your own language and you can hear German, French, Italian, um, Russian and English. I prefer speaking my own language, which is German. It's very important matters to be discussed. I don't want any misunderstandings, so welcome to this meeting convened at such short no notice on the results of the Ukrainian parliament parliamentary elections from October this year. And we'd like to discuss questions of future developments and the pros perspective of relations between the EU and Ukraine. I hear that there will be some colleagues taking uh, part in this discussion about uh, shale gas because we've heard many who were rather outraged as to the lobbying going on uh, carried on by the energy sector in this respect but I have some announcements Yuri Miroshnichenko of the Party of Regions had to apologize last minute. He is taking part in budgetary discussions and is being repl uh, replaced or substituted by Mr. Kuchara. Is that correct? That was right. Uh, welcome to you. I will, of course, uh, introduce all of us here at the top table. But by way of information to all of those who are not too familiar with the situation in Ukraine. On the 28th of October this year, parliamentary elections were held overall. In, there's 450 members in the Ukrainian parliament. The term, parliamentary term in Ukraine is five years. Half of the members are elected through party lists and the other half are the elected through um, direct mandate in their constituencies. Six, uh, 26 parties took part in the elections, five of whom uh, exceeded the 5% hurdle and have uh, got a seat in the parliament. According to the provisional results, the part of the regions, President Yanukovych's party, have uh, managed to get about 30 percent. That's 187 man, uh, mandates. The biggest party, of Mrs. Timoshenko, together with some other opposition parties, have 25.54 percent, and they have 103 seats. The party of Vitali Klitschko, the sportsman, of 13 plus percent and 40 seats, the Communist Party of the Ukraine achieved 13.18 percent and they have 32 seats and there's 10 percent for the last party with 37 seats. That result is virtually the same as was achieved through the exit polls which were carried out by various journalists. So one can assume that the result is more or less fairly clearly respecting the political balance and the political um, aspirations of the Ukrainian people. Following a decision of the Electoral Commission, five constituencies are going to have a runoff or a second poll and it's only for five man mandates, five seats. These seats have not yet been filled and they will only uh, be established after the result is published. Overall, there have been a high number, 3,000 700 odd observers observed those elections that's really unprecedented as regards the 
uh, numbers deployed to observe. The European Union sent observers to there are a number of independent organizations who were amongst the observers and then after the elections of course there were, was some criticism leveled by the OSCE who said that the elections were rigged and there were lack of transparency alleged party financing and unbalanced reporting in the press on this ladies and gentlemen I would say this is the OSCE observers on uh, elections in Ukraine not, not uh, Austria or Great Britain but Ukraine I dare say this uh, could be done for any country I know that from my own country when I look at financing and referring to the press and the broadcasts I've had to suffer the same could say the same for Austria the Ukraine Ukraine are now trying quite apart from election results are trying to bring in a European dimension in its foreign policy it's trying to reform the justice wants to reach European standards and virtually all parties except for the communists want to embrace European perspective as a desirable guideline of foreign policy in the Ukraine today uh, we have an interesting set of panelists I hope that we'll have enough time to cover the points for discussion properly we will arrange it in such a way so that everybody will have a chance to discuss first the elections and then the outlook for relations between Ukraine and the European Union we have replacing the government party Mr. Leonid Kushara welcome to you Mr. Kushara he is a member himself has been re-elected for the part of regions congratulations on being re-elected he is a substitute leader of his party and before he was uh, one of the leading diplomats of his country I have a representative of the opposition party Mr. Andrei Senchenko to my right here at the far right he is a member of the bureau of his party party of Mrs. Timoshenko he is a member of the legal affairs committee and goes as a shadow minister uh, for finance so if the party were to win he would be the minister of finance and then another panelist Mr. Bondarenko Oleg Bondarenko is a journalist he studied political science from the Russian Academy of Sciences and uh, works in an agency for strategic communication welcome to you and then Madam Irov here to my right as Mateusz Piskorski I suppose anyone who is the Austrian press would know him he leads an independent election organi uh, observation organization he will introduce himself I'm sure um, Matthias Biskorski is at the head of an international organization specializing in independent election observations I might add that I enjoy working with Matthias Biskorski because he is not representing any major powers when I observed the elections in Russia I gained the impression then that one day after the election I had the impression that the reports are uh, you know older than election procedures themselves as we were presented it but that's for the introduction but was, I'd ask him to give us his impressions of his experience during those elections and then we continue with Mr. Kushara after which 
We'll have Mr. Andrei Sechenko and finally Mr. Bondarenko to wind up and then we have the open discussion with the floor participating. Go ahead. Better speak English. Uh, well, uh, first and foremost, I'm really glad that we have a possibility, a rare possibility to discuss about such a hot topic as Ukrainian parliamentary elections, uh, which were mm, uh, conveyed on the 28th of uh, October this year. I'm glad because uh, the topic of uh, these elections and uh, all the discussions about uh, these elections, not only here in the European Parliament, but also in other international parliamentary assemblies, uh, in uh, international discussion forums, were so controversial, as well as the statements and uh, uh, evaluations of the electoral process, that there is really what to discuss about. And uh, first and foremost, I'm also glad that uh, the high representatives of uh, two major Ukrainian political forces are present here, and uh, I'm sure that they will tell us a lot about their own feelings about the electoral process as they were direct participants or even the most important key players in the Ukrainian political scene. Then uh, I see here uh, in this uh, room several members of uh, European Parliament who have participated in an uh, election monitoring mission in uh, Ukraine, visiting several uh, places, several regions of uh, the country, and uh, I also hope that they will uh, exchange uh, with uh, us their views, their ideas, and uh, their impressions after the elections. But uh, to say a very short conclusion about uh, the electoral process in Ukraine, as I have some experience in election monitoring, I was leading one of the uh, monitoring missions at the Ukrainian presidential elections in 2010. Then uh, I was a member of uh, one of the missions at these parliamentary elections, and uh, before, in a totally different political circumstances, I was an observer in Ukraine in 2006 also. Uh, so I have a, a lot of impressions about the electoral process as such, as uh, well as the organization I represent, the European Center of Geopolitical Analysis, which, as uh, Mr. Stadler told, uh, is one of those independent European uh, network organizations which uh, cover the electoral topics and uh, which uh, prepare independent elector election monitoring missions. So I would like to say that uh, Ukrainian elections, as well as uh, any elections in any of the European countries have their advantages and disadvantages when it comes to, when it comes to the electoral process and to the day of voting. The Ukrainian elections, also those which we observed uh, this year, uh, are always uh, a kind of test for state structures and uh, I feel personally that the state structures of Ukraine have got very positive results in passing this test from the organizational point of view. The only remarks our mission had, as well as several other independent mission uh, voiced also, uh, were the remarks about uh, the majoritarian electoral districts and uh, I hope that we'll have a possibility to discuss today the particular uh, characteristics of uh, majoritarian electoral systems because for instance in, in Poland, my home country as well as in several other countries we are now discussing about electoral reforms and Ukraine has just um, uh, passed their first test within a new electoral system, which means half majoritarian, half proportional system. And uh, of course, again, this system has its advantages and disadvantages. I think we'll um, have a possibility to discuss it in detail. 
Then uh, what I would like to tell is also that I got an impression, uh, well, I got the same impression in 2010, to be honest, that uh, there are unfortunately several people which are trying to abuse the Institute of uh, Election Monitoring for several political reasons or um, uh, goals which they represent. Which means that not every uh, electoral monitoring mission which was present uh, at the Ukrainian elections this time also uh, was a mission of professionals and of unbiased observers. Some of them had their political sympathies and uh, we should make it clear that some of them made statements which were, let's say, prepared long before the election day. That's also the problem. Well, it concerns not only Ukraine, but several other Eastern European countries, so it's not a particular Ukrainian problem. Uh, then uh, I got an impression that several election observation missions, or even several individual observers, observed different elections the same day in Ukraine on 28th of October, because they came to totally different conclusions. Uh, this makes me think mm, that uh, there should be perhaps in the future some common election observation standards established. For instance, uh, uh, in Ukraine, like, uh, I don't know, common questionnaires for all the observers which uh, are coming as international observers uh, to observe for Ukrainian elections, uh, which might make uh, the whole observation process even more just, fair and transparent than it was before. Uh, then, of course, we know that from the European perspective there, there were several forces present during the elections, during the electoral process in Ukraine, which were try, trying to delegitimize the electoral process uh, and to weaken the image of uh, Ukraine as a state, as a sovereign uh, democratic uh, state in Europe, including European Union. That's why it's really, it's really good uh, and reasonable that we have uh, this rare opportunity to discuss the results of the elections and the impact of the elections on European perspectives of Ukraine uh, in uh, the future. So, uh, mm, to make it short, I really do think that Ukraine is a contemporary European state and that we should discuss uh, Ukrainian elections on the same level of, uh, on the same, let's say, emotional level as we discuss, for instance, the elections in Poland or in any other uh, country of uh, Europe, uh, remembering about advantages and disadvantages, but not trying to delegitimize the electoral, elections and electoral process as a whole. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. I'd like to welcome Mr. Nikola Tochitsky, the permanent representative of Ukraine and the European Union. Welcome, Mr. Ambassador. Where are you? We welcome you. Hello. Let's now continue with our brief statements. Leonid Koshara is next for the Party of the Regions, after which, seamlessly, we'll have the opposition speak, Mr. Sechenko, that is. Go ahead. Good afternoon, and thank you. Uh, uh, to start, uh, I'd like to thank you organizers of this event. And uh, we are very pleased that uh, the Ukrainian question is so much topical outside of Ukraine. And uh, Mr. Stadler, special thanks for you, because really uh, the elections are over in Ukraine, but uh, the debates are still on. And uh, uh, a colleague of mine, Mr. Senchenko, who is here, so uh, I believe uh, he came here not far ago as myself, because I'm directly from the plane from Frankfurt. Uh, so uh, Ukraine really had another parliamentary elections a few weeks ago. Uh, it was a regular routine, to my mind, election, and uh, Ukraine 
actually is a country of uh, continuing elections. Every two years we have an election. The last one we had in 2010, we elected our president, and we had also lo local elections. And uh, the next one will be in 2015. And uh, to many people in my country, uh, the past election really was quite uh, a routine, normal constitutional procedure. So, but uh, why the Ukrainian elections uh, are so topical outside of Ukraine? To my mind, there are a few points uh, which may add, add some flavor uh, uh, to uh, the political process in Ukraine. Of course, uh, that's not a secret that uh, the case of former Prime Minister Yulia Tymoshenko is quite discussable in Ukraine and outside. Uh, another point is, I think, that uh, the opposition in Ukraine has been always strong. And, for example, my party, which is now a ruling party, was two times in the opposition. And believe me, we were a very tough opposition. Today, the opposition is also very tough in Ukraine. And uh, the opposition tried to... Uh, uh, to convince uh, the people of Ukraine and the international community that uh, this election will be a decisive step uh, forward, that it will be an extraordinary event. That's why uh, many observers, especially outside, they uh, were inspired by uh, uh, such statements uh, f from our opposition, and they really believed that the election is changing something considerably in Ukraine. But as I told you, it was a routine constitutional procedure, and actually uh, the election uh, itself was uh, quite predictable. Why I'm saying that, that it was predictable? First of all, uh, we really changed the system, and uh, today we are back to the uh, election system we had in 2002. And uh, it's a mixed system, and uh, half of the parliament, uh, as it was said, uh, is elected by single ma mandate districts and half by party lists. And uh, in fact, uh, the reintroduction of uh, elections in single mandate districts uh, actually also add some uh, f flavor to the election and in fact we had two elections in parallel one on the uh, single uh, nation district and uh, 225 on single mandate districts uh, what was also unusual, and uh, this is the point which has, was also mentioned here, the, the enormous number of international observers. And it was, uh, in our history, it was number two record number of international observers. 3,800 people came to uh, observe the elections in Ukraine. The record number was in uh, 2004, when more than 14,000 international observers came uh, for observation of the presidential elections of 2004. Uh, to my mind, this is not just a record number uh, for Ukraine, but it's a record number totally for entire Europe, because uh, my experience and what I know uh, show that uh, no country on the OSCE area didn't have so big number of international observers <laughs> through years, so that's quite for sure. And uh, uh, the observers came uh, in, uh, from 35 international governmental and non-governmental organizations and from 28 uh, single countries. Uh, what was surprising that the, big, the biggest mission came from Canada. Canada sent uh, in three missions or even four missions, including OEC or DEER mission, uh, around 800 uh, Ukra uh, 
Canadian nationals to observe. And so, and actually it was a record number of observers for Canada as well. And it's a matter of a big, of a big scandal. In Canada, if you check the internet, you'll find that uh, the uh, uh, observation missions to Ukraine are in the focus of a scandal, or political scandal in Canada between the two biggest parties, the Tories uh, and the Labourists. Uh, so, but uh, I won't be explaining why. Uh, I think uh, many people who uh, know Ukraine, so they understand why it happened. So, and about the predictability, it was not a secret. Uh, that uh, the party of regions, my party and the ruling party in Ukraine, uh, was leading through all the campaign. And uh, we got a result which is very close to many uh, public polls uh, organized uh, on the eve uh, of, of the elections. Uh, besides, uh, another pre predictability was that exactly on the election day we had uh, four uh, all Ukrainian uh, exit polls and uh, as far as I know two parallel counting of votes. And all uh, exit polls and all parallel countings provided uh, by the United Opposition Party and by the Party of Regions showed approximately the same result. Which means that uh, minor problems we had in the course of elections uh, uh, could not uh, influence over the final result of the elections. Uh, moreover, besides international observers, uh, we had uh, thousands of domestic observers. And, for example, my country uh, um, had 36,000 uh, observers all around Ukraine. I don't know how many observers uh, were uh, representing uh, the United Opposition, so, but uh, what I know from the... Uh, Mr. Klitschko's headquarters, they had uh, around 60,000 of observers. That's 60, 60,000 observers. So it means that the Ukrainian campaign and the election day uh, perhaps uh, was the most observed event that very day in the world because of hundreds of thousands of people uh, taking part in the election process. And uh, uh, of course, uh, as far as uh, we had, uh, as I told you, in fact, uh, two campaigns, one by party list, another one uh, by uh, single mandate districts, uh, we had uh, some problems and they are quite known and today there is a decision on re-election, uh, court's decisions on re-election in five uh, uh, districts. Uh, also uh, the office of the prosecutor general initiated few criminal cases against uh, participants of the campaign who allegedly violated the law and the rules in the course of, of the campaign and the election day. So and we'll see what will be uh, the result of, of those criminal proceedings. Uh, and a uh, few final points. Uh, as it was mentioned here, uh, there is a sort of cacophony around uh, of opinions around the Ukrainian elections, from very much positive to very much negative. And uh, on one hand, uh, for me, uh, and this past campaign was number six for me, and I have got 
quite uh, good experience in campaigning. So it indicates on one hand that uh, Ukraine is really in the very focus of, of European and uh, in international interests. But on, on another hand, uh, which is less fortunate, uh, I think Ukraine appears to be in the focus of a political fight uh, outside of Ukraine also. And uh, I won't be touching any EU member states, So, but uh, in this uh, audience uh, more, uh, uh, more e easier to cite uh, overseas countries like Canada. And uh, quite for sure that, unfortunately, Ukraine is in the focus of political fight uh, in some countries, and uh, it had a sort of uh, misstating the uh, uh, true outcome of the elections and uh, uh, a sort of uh, uh, confusing not only for uh, Ukrainian people but also for our partners abroad. So uh, I won't be also taking more of your time, and uh, I expect that there will be questions from the audience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, uh, Mr. Senchenko, it's your floor. Please. Thank you. I would like to thank, first and foremost, Mr. Shedler, who initiated today's roundtable and all the colleagues who are part of this roundtable and who paid significant attention and interest to Ukraine. For us, the elections, past elections, were not only a competition of political parties, and Mr. Kajara and I represent two organizations that traditionally compete on the Ukrainian political landscape. These elections for us were an attempt to form a legitimate parliament. It may sound somewhat surprising because each elections in each country are supposed to form a legitimate parliament, but it's a problem. It's been a problem in Ukraine, a many, long time problem. Today we have a constitution that's come into effect unconstitutionally through a decision by the Constitutional Court but not the Parliament who has uh, been empowered by the people to pass the Constitution. As a result we have uh, an artificially expanded mandate of the President. As a result we have the Ukrainian government that was formed in accordance with this Constitution that was introduced by, an illegi by uh, illegitimately. So it's important, it was important for us to have the Ukrainian parliament as a legitimate one. The elections as they were taking place were quite peaceful up till the last stage, but as the results were counted and the votes were counted, unprecedented things started to happen and I think many TV com tea companies of the world broadcast those episodes when special right police forces were storming polling stations and were impacting the outcome of the elections and the composition of the Ukrainian parliament and the Ukrainian authorities. In my opinion, but in my opinion, what is now being presented as certain occasional occurrences that are linked to the majoritarian uh, component of the elections were not really by chance. The thing is, the foundations for this, so it is such an incorrect, inaccurate finish of the campaign, were actually laid in the beginning when the manipulations of law were introduced when the parties on the right were actually were not allowed to participate in the, in the polling stations. The Central Election Commission of Ukraine set up a way of picking the members of the commission by selecting the committee members by 
checks and as a result many representatives like Udar and Freedom Party did not make it so Mr Shadlett mentioned that 26 political parties participated in the Ukrainian elections yes indeed uh, that was the number of parties that moved their lists forward but more than 80 parties participated in the manipulations of the elections reserve. These were the parties, so-called SOFA parties, there were so-called formal registration of the parties that were just existing right there on, the paper, on paper, but those parties were allowed to put forward their candidates into every election commission of the country and it, it, was, it, it, it was exactly those people who at the last stage of elections when they were counting the votes, uh, when they were falsifying the elections, there was a difference of 12,000 votes in favour of the opposition. There were attempts to give, to hand victory down to the ruling party representative. What is presented as a compromise today? The idea of having a re-election, re having re-elections held in five constituencies. They are trying to, mo to model it not as the elections but like a chess game let's say we're playing chess I'm losing I'm, I'm on the losing end then I turn the turn the board around and say let's just play again I've lost but where's the compromise here it's not a problem of five constituencies where there is a striking difference not even hun where tens or hundreds of votes in favour of oppositions. We're, to uh, we're, th we're talking about 13 constituencies where these doubts were, uh, where these were serious violations. 35 constituencies were doubtful in terms of counting in, f in favour. Well, there, if there is a difference between the opposition and the ruling party, if that difference is insignificant, that difference actually is capable of impacting the political course of the country and the influence of the country. When we talk about the proportional component of the elections, first and foremost I'd like to say that we've gained a positive result because three parties that consider themselves opposition, in opposition to the current regime, they gathered together more, significantly more, than the ruling party of the regions. Yes, indeed, the total balance of forces in the parliament is not, is not determined by differences between programs and ideologies, but the money, rather, that was applied and directed, in, especially in the majoritarian constituencies during these elections, to buy votes, to manipulate votes. You know, when each elections we hear about violations but they're insignificant that begs the question what is significant and what is insignificant when it comes to violations an average number of voters at the at a polling station is about 1800 25 votes at each station that were not given to the opposition but rather given to the power changed the picture around fully in 2010 only 25 percent of all the polling station numbers um, with 18 with 1800 per station basically that is capable of changing the face of the Ukrainian authorities I brought here falsified certificates that were used by their authorities to falsify the elections at just one polling station. It was the Republic of Crimea where I live and where I was in charge of organizing elections on behalf of the United Opposition. This is just one polling station in the city of Yalta. 87 falsified certificates uh, certifying that voters were sick that according we have this according to the Ukrainian legislation they have the right to vote at home if they are sick because they're not feeling well this is an acronym from the past these certificates were deemed falsified and as, a, and as an MP member of parliament I appeal to the prosecutor general of Crimea who is the deputy prosecutor general of Ukraine um, as t and it was t I was told it's a crime and 
I was given three pages of answer saying, do appeal to the polling station, to the election commission. Well, imagine at each of 34 polling stations in the country, we would have the same amount of falsified voters with falsified certi certificates that would get their ballots and cast their votes. That would change cardinally the face of Ukrainian power and authorities, and that would change cardinally the courts of Ukraine. That's why I would like to, th to thank everybody, everybody who really cared, and from for Europe and a variety of organization, organizations who sent their observers. It's important for us to have an objective picture, and it's important to have correct conclusions drawn from that with regard to the Ukrainian elections, with regard to the legislation. It was based on the result, uh, with regard to the res to the results of these elections. And we hope that. First and foremost, as citizens, we'd be able to draw conclusions from that. As the politicians, we'd be able to draw conclusions from that in order to s change the situation in the country. And, of course, we hope that this attention will persevere because, for us, the European integration of Ukraine are not just hollow words that we use to speculate, but it's our objective. And we're going to go forward to this objective by changing the situation in, in the country, by choosing a legitimate authorities, and by fighting for democratic values that are fundamentally important for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleague. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you will have noticed that the political positions differ and that that filters through into their view of the observations, but we have a journalist here, so hopefully we can have an independent account so, Vojek Bodarenko, could I ask you to just tell us about your agency briefly and then to give us your report on the uh, observations during the Ukraine elections? Thank you very much, Mr. Stadler, for the opportunity for organizing such an interesting discussion within the European Parliament. I was not an international uh, observer at these elections, but I've been wor working for more than seven years with a variety of issues uh, related to Ukraine, political consulting, etc. And I can tell you that for me, during these elections, if I were to talk about such a delicate issue as possible falsifications and the scale of it, then one polling station was quite indicative of that in Kiev, in the city of Kiev, in the Darnisa area at the outskirts of Kiev, where a secretary of the city uh, city council, Galina Berega, a businesswoman who was quite influential, she lost about 100 votes. Even though she had a lot of financial and administrative resources, she did lose by 100 of votes to a young representative of a radical party, uh, Svoboda uh, Olienko. Many people paid attention to that indicative example where this administrative resource, as they call it, they didn't mean, that didn't mean anything, but by and large, speaking generally about the future prospects of relations between the EU and Ukraine after the elections, I would note a couple of things here. Unlike historic leaders of democratic process in the world where, like such as USA, where OSCE observers were not allowed to participate. Ukraine, as a young democracy, was looking to legitimize its election procedure in Europe and in all directions. The most important thing for Ukraine for today now is a European integration direction, but we should not forget about other vectors um, for Ukraine, such as Eurasian vector the subject matter that we're discussing today and the prospects of relations between Ukraine and the European Union after the elections is directly linked to the intensity of uh, deepening uh, the eastern policies of Ukraine, the implementation of the Ukrainian interest in the integration of Eurasian structures such as Eurasia, uh, so Customs Union and, Eura and Eura Eurasian Economic Union. Ukraine can expand its legitimate uh, legitimacy, not only in the West but in the East. But the Euro Eurasian Parliament uh, 
in the nearest future would allow to talk about the Ukrainian representation in that parliament. But what is, more, what is interesting here is that the eastern integration of Ukraine sh must not be confrontational in nature. On the contrary, it should give a chance to keep the European vector of Ukrainian cooperation, but jointly with Russia. Together with Russia to Europe can become a promising potential future for Ukraine, in fact, if that is selected. And this collective format for, U for European integration has a lot of pluses, but the key plus is about non-confrontational scenario, about non-confrontational of the Ukrainian-European integration. And before the last elections, the political agenda of Ukraine was based on the con con to standing between East and West, e historically, Eurasian and European values. Undoubtedly, it was artificial, artificially uh, created, and it was a hostage uh, to those who benefited from playing uh, East against West of Ukraine. And of course, in reality, this difference between the East and West of Ukraine is not critical. The Ukraine and Russia belong to Europe, not only geographically, but civilization-wise. And this agenda that, unfortunately, still is in effect up to today, is from the past, from the times of the Iron Curtain, from the times when the communist atheistic East was counter-standing against the uh, capitalist West. But, I'm sorry, but the East is no longer atheistic and communist, and therefore today's agenda and tomorrow's agenda has a different system of coordinates and that's north and south. I mean the conflicts that are taking place now in Europe, both in Europe and the world, they actually, this is the nature, this is their nature and this is how it's, how it's positioned, north versus south, not east versus west and in this context of course Russia and uh, Europe are on the same side. This concept would allow of course the most successful, in my opinion, implementation of the European po integration policy, both for Ukraine and Moscow. The most obvious example is when President Yushchenko's, when Yush Mr. Yushchenko was the president, it was Ukraine's uh, accession to WTO that was not, as many international experts stated, not beneficial economically for Ukraine because Ukraine lost out in their dialogues with Europe and WTO and was forced to give up on a number of parameters, give in on a number of parameters. At the same time, Russia's accession to WTO together with Belarus has shown a certain pluses. These negotiations took a long time, but it's always a more reliable way to negotiate together and gives strength in your position and gives you good protection presenting your interests that each individual country has. If a previous concept was to be kept, then Ukraine soon will confront, will be, will face the need to reaffirm it in its own international legitimacy, not only in the European Parliament, but also in the Eurasian Parliament. That may be a threat in ca if Ukraine stays in the same system of coordinates, West-East. I hope this system, the of coordinates will be broken, will be broken shortly, and the confrontational nature of the Ukrainian agenda will come to an end. Thank you. Thank you, sir, Herr Bodarenko. We have, as we said, four statements. As I was saying, we've heard four statements now from the top table. We've heard two different views on whether the elections were fair. I don't think you can have any elections that run entirely smoothly. And I would like to tell my colleagues from the Ukraine that you, you shouldn't perceive us as looking down at you about your elections. There's not a single country in the world where you have fully free elections and where all political groups are happy with how the elections went. There were 
independent candidates as well, which did get voted into office. There were three MEPs that came through the direct elections and they now have their seat. Two from the uh, People's Party, one from Union, 43 from an independent, independent list. So uh, people standing independently uh, and getting elected through their own personality. So there's quite a few members of parliament uh, that were voted in independently and I do think that that uh, points to a certain um, uh, democratic path that was followed. Now I listened with a great deal of course to what Mr. Bodorenko said as well. Um, uh, a journalist's take on the elections. It's interesting to hear from you, sir, irrespective of where you stand uh, on the elections, of course. It's up to the Ukraine to put together its democratic institutions, of course, uh, and that uh, is a purview of their sovereign rights. We heard about you about the rapprochement to Europe. We'll also need to look at how that pans out in the future, what the Ukraine's take is on the EU and also what their relations with Russia are. So I think that's all very interesting. So, damit uh, darf ich in die Diskussion einsteigen. Und Let me open the floor. And if you have any questions or any interventions, then please don't hesitate. So, speak frankly, please, if you have questions or comments to make. Yes, please go ahead, sir. Dobry deň. Uh, Wenn Sie vielleicht auch dazu sagen, wen Sie hier sind. Can you repeat? Could you introduce yourself? To say who okay, are you? Okay, okay, okay. Uh, Mnie zawód Igor. I'm Andrushenka Igor. I'm from the Democratic Alliance, but uh, I'm an intern at the European Parliament. I'd like to ask two questions to uh, the members of uh, Ukrainian Parliament. First, Alexander, I heard that uh, the administrative authorities' backing was used in this election, uh, sometimes at the lowest level, at the level of the polling station, and also in other area. So, what? What do you think should be done to reduce this kind of uh, influence from the administrative authorities, from the administration on the election processes? Now, my second question is to Andrei Senchenko. What steps do you expect from the opposition to counteract the actions of the majority? Is there an opportunity to put together a, your own majority in the uh, European Parliament, in the Ukrainian Parliament? Das macht die Diskussion lebendiger. Thank you. Uh, uh, Господин Андрющенко, Андрющенко, спасибо за... So, Mr. Andrychenko, I apologize, I'll speak, I'll speak English this time. Question with regard to the use of administrative resource. Uh, uh, I would reply uh, that uh, the politological term administrative resource, I think, was established up to, after a number of elections on the post-Soviet space. And uh, before that, uh, I, I don't think you can find such a term uh, with regard to uh, any other election uh, in the west of Ukraine or in the east. So what does it mean? So it means that uh, a, a certain public officer uh, uses uh, his office 
to promote himself or somebody else, his friend or relatives to his, uh, in the election process. And uh, I would remind that at the very beginning of, of the campaign, President Yanukovych uh, said that uh, members of the Cabinet of Ministers, uh, governors of the regions in Ukraine, top administrative officers uh, on the local level should not run. Uh, saying that uh, he and the ruling party, we all wanted uh, to prevent uh, uh, the use of, the, of this administrative resource. So, but unfortunately, uh, if you see uh, our party list, so you may find a few ministers on the list, two vice prime ministers. Uh, uh, we know that some governors also ran the campaign, some of them won, some of them lost. Uh, many top officials on the Ryan level, level the same. So it means, uh, first of all, I, I don't know, maybe those people uh, simply were not sure about their political future. And, uh, you know, today there is a statement by the president that uh, uh, people from the executive branch uh, who uh, have won the election uh, should decide whether they want to be in the parliament or uh, will remain on their positions. But I am not sure that after uh, they decided to run, they will be on their executive positions. Uh, as I also said here, uh, so the uh, more or less known result uh, was quite clear weeks before the election, and that's why for the ruling party it was no uh, use uh, it, uh, to, uh, to uh, apply administrative resource. Uh, why? Because uh, uh, we all knew that uh, the election campaign and the election day will be under uh, thorough control by the by other political parties and by international observers. But of, of course it happened, especially on single mandate districts. Uh, it comes uh, from the lack of uh, democratic tradition in Ukraine, and uh, it comes from the quite natural wish uh, to win using all means possible. And uh, I think uh, today, uh, as I also told you, uh, the uh, prosecutors started uh, some criminal investigations against uh, participants of the uh, election process, and uh, we will see will that investigation bring uh, some violators of the law to the court or not. So, but uh, I accept this is a bad political tradition. This is a violation of the law, and we really have several cases on that. And because of that, today we have criminal investigations and we have uh, respective re-elections re in five constituencies. This would be my reply. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, there is a theory of election, and this is also uh, the actual reality of uh, the, this election. I should say that authorities in Ukraine are well organized, and, and they practice a very tough approach to the election, and uh, they also practice some technological methods. They, were, they had the backing of the judiciary, because there are numerous examples when uh, the positions, for instance, were thrown in, in, uh, in jail. Um, Mr. Lutsenko, Mrs. Mrs. Timoshenko. But uh, the influence of the authorities uh, uh, demonstrates that, for instance, in the area where I live, uh, we launched 86 various complaints to uh, the courts and, and uh, the replies from the court 
were absolutely not supportive. On the contrary, they, they did not want to do anything about it. Now, you mentioned their administrative backing of the authorities, and I would like to cite some of the examples from, again, from our precincts. It's, for instance, the Minister of Education of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea was running for the election, and she's going to get uh, the um, mem uh, mandate as a result of the election and become a member of parliament. So all teachers who are actually under the influence of the Ministry of Education, given that we don't have an independent judiciary, were asked to take a picture by a mobile phone of their ballots and to show these pictures to the school principals. It's an absurd situation. One of my, actually sisters, uh, she's a teacher, and uh, even though the principal of her school knew that I am a leading figure in the opposition, and um, still she was instructed to do this. So isn't that an administrative influence? Because it's just because the system of our judiciary is paralyzed. Anybody, a doctor or a, uh, a teacher, if you do not comply, you will be fired the next day. And no Ukrainian court would be able to support his claims. In addition to that, our voters are not protected in economic terms either. For example, in a small settlement in the rural area, the average old age pension is uh, r rarely exceeds a hundred dollars, and bribes by those people who were trying to influence the election would offer a hundred. That is a thousand dollars to an old age pensioner. So somebody who just survives on a very tiny pension. Actually, it's impossible to live uh, for pensioners. Of course, a lot of pensioners responded to that, and of course, that helped to rig this election. Now, the authorities, as I said, uh, practice some technological methods. Uh, and this is, this is in line with their principles that influenced the election in terms of putting pressure to bear on independent mass media, and total brainwashing of um, our people through the media channels, which are monopolized in our country, because they either belong to the state or to the what we call the oligarchs. So there was no equality in access to the media. There was no chance of trying to convince our people. It was uh, constant manipulation. Public opinion was manipulated by the mass media, and any anybody who would dissent was punished. So that, that's that's what we describe as an administrative backing or administrative resource, as they say, in our election. Now about the majority. I already mentioned that Ukraine is faced with a very tough situation, and if elections were proportional as as were done in the past it would be clear that the opposition gained more votes. But since there was a majority principle that was added to this, the 13 precincts that were in fact characterized uh, by uh, rigging uh, when uh, the outcomes were really rigged, that changes the balance. Without them, we don't have a majority as a, as a position. But if we add that, Balanced, then we would be in majority. There is another method that is practiced by the Ukrainian authorities. For example, we have uh, we know that there are 76 individuals who became members of parliament as a result of this majority principle. Those political parties that uh, identify some some little problems, like they, um, they run a business or their relatives run a business, and the, the pressure can be put to bear on them in order to change the situation and to create a pro 
uh, uh, President's uh, majority. Thank you. Dann hat man das Gefühl, dass get the impression that Austria is really closer to Ukraine than Paris. It is actually closer. It's only about 100 kilometers, whereas to Paris is a lot more. Now, it does seem familiar in Austria. We have the biggest number of party membership in Europe. For opportunistic reasons, people might even belong to two. So basically, things are not that special in Ukraine. In fact, you can find similar situations elsewhere in Europe too. Mr. Stoyanov will carry on. Shall we have a little uh, round of questions from the European Parliament? Mr. Golnisch, Mr. Salewski from Poland. Go ahead. The floor is open now for three or so questions. I'll uh, rather make observations than to ask any concrete questions. Uh, for our guests, uh, with some of them we know each other. My name is Dimitar Stoyanov. I am an MEP elected from Bulgaria. I am a substitute member to the delegation of the European Parliament uh, to, the, uh, <coughs> to Ukraine. Uh, unfortunately, I was not able to attend the uh, elections as an observer because at the same time my main delegation was about to have a meeting in Macedonia. Unfortunately, this one was cancelled, so I, had <laughs> I didn't have the opportunity neither to come in Ukraine nor to Macedonia, so it was a uh, a streak of bad luck that I had with my delegations this autumn. So uh, I would like to make uh, the following observation first on the question that was raised by Mr. Shenchenko on the, the constitutional matters. Uh, I was in Ukraine in 2010 right after the local elections took place. And, uh, and uh, at that time the matter of the term of the Verkhovna Rada was still under debate and it was still it still wasn't sent to the constitutional court so I asked many questions as Mr. Kujara maybe remembers uh, at that time about the constitu constitutional situations even before the case in the constitutional court was started and I made, made up my mind I, uh, I specialized I'm a lawyer by my profession and I specialized in the comparative constitutional law and I can say that I'm uh, probably the best lawyer in Bulgaria in this matter who is not in academical circles and who is not in university. So I made up my mind uh, on this uh, thing and I was very pleased when the Constitutional Court of Ukraine more than one year later took the same decision that I was, have deemed as should be just and right much before the procedure was started. So from the constitutional point of view I think that uh, everything was according to the law and to the principle of the constitutional law in Europe and in the other places uh, in the democratic world. About the um, carrying out of the elections and the other problems that were mentioned, I would like to point out that um, I personally also I am specialist in the electoral systems and I can say the same thing about the the constitutional things that I may be the best lawyer in Bulgaria in electoral systems who is not an academician. Um, I personally oppose these mixed systems of proportional and majoritarian elections. Uh, this is because first it violates the first principle of democracy, one citizen, one vote. You give every citizen two votes and this creates a two classes of members of parliament after the elections. It creates also a very, uh, in, especially in the single seat constituency, a very heated battle that the, the candidates are very much personally interested in making, ma making it so that they are ready to do everything. And often this everything is electoral violations. So I'm personally uh, opposed to this mixed system. So I'm very in favor of a pure proportional system with the possibility of preferences put in the party lists, so eventually the party list could be rearranged by the voters and not to be fixed one. Uh, so uh, it's uh, not, uh, it, it does not come a surprise for me that the main problems are discussed with the election in the single seat constituencies. Uh, 
here I should uh, point out that when the new uh, Ukrainian uh, legislation on the elections was adopted, it was adopted by an overwhelming majority in the Verkhovna Rada. And uh, most of the opposition also voted for these things that now are pointed out as problematic. So uh, I, I, I don't think that it can be blamed on, on the governing party and uh, all the political class in Ukraine should take responsibility for these uh, situations. Uh, about the, for example, the drawing lots for the electoral committees, it's absolutely incomprehensible for me. It's, it cannot be a, a system based on law which provides some justice to draw lots. It's something from, I don't know, I, I cannot really understand it, such kind of system, so, so this should be changed and some other system should be found because the electoral committees in the polling stations, they are the most important, important things in every election because they count the votes really. So um, about the certificates to vote in another place, uh, I can tell you we have a big, big problems with this in Bulgaria for years and years, and in the, later, the, the latest overhaul of the Bulgarian legislation, we just abolish them. So this is my recommendation to, for you to do the same. Just abolish these, these because there is no other way to solve the problem with uh, the certificates to vote um, on the another place. And uh, on the latest place, uh, I had a meeting with uh, one of the candidates, Mr. Kise, who is uh, a leader of the Bulgarian community in Ukraine. Uh, he was elected to Verkhovna Rada, uh, but uh, I have a meeting with Mr. Kise. I had a meeting with Mr. Kise also in 2010 after the regional elections when he was elected to the Odessa Regional Council. And he, in both occasions, complained of the same thing about the single member uh, constituency that uh, uh, a procedure that even has a name in, uh, in the electoral law, law called gerrymandy was applied and the gerrymandy is when you, when you draw the borders of the co constituencies you do it in the way that uh, a particular social group in this, uh, in, in this place is dispersed among the different constituencies and they cannot, f they cannot make a majority so he complained that the Bulgarian community, uh, especially on this region, was, I, I'm finishing, this is the last thing, was uh, divided in this way. Well, his election shows that this is, it was not such a severe thing, but I think that it should be uh, considered by the, the next Verkhov Narada. Thank you. Thank you. But let us uh, concentrate the debate about uh, uh, the uh, Ukraine elections and not the Bulgarian elections. Please. The last thing was in, on the Ukrainian elections. Yes, okay. Yes, in, in the uh, Bulgarian and there is another remark, uh, Yulao, uh, that also a great country like the Federal Republic of Germany has a mixed system in the, uh, in the Constitution about uh, to elect to the, the members of the Bundestag. Now, Mr. Golish, please. Thank you. Thank you. May I speak French? Yes, the gentleman may speak French, of course. Thank you very much. I'm Bruno Golnisch, European Member of Parliament, non-attached member of the Front National in France. I'd like to ask a few questions. I'm sorry for having arrived uh, uh, late. I will have to leave before the end of the meeting, unfortunately. My apologies. Poss possibly my question has already been uh, uh, answered. I understand that 225 members are elected in a single um, ticket pro um, process. Is this a bit like in the UK or two rounds as in France? That's my first question. My second question is the 225 other members who are elected on a list basis, proportional list, is this a list on a national basis or on a regional basis? That's my second question. I'd like uh, to uh, make a couple of comments. When it comes to the ministers who stand for election, I think what may be criticized, it's not that ministers should be candidates. In many democratic countries, they do stand for elections. That is very often the abusive use they make of their uh, power. 
uh, and come back to my own country because in Europe, in the European Union, we keep teaching people around the world lessons, but I belong to a political party which represents about 8 million voters and for a quarter of a century in France has not had a single senator, a single member of parliament the electoral process is designed to keep them outside of political life. In the last elections in 2012, we reached the third place, 18% of the vote to the presidential seat. This was uh, confirmed in the legislative elections, and we only have two members out of 570 in the chamber. The situation in France, I would say, is worse than in Ukraine. It's not to say that Mr. Senchenko's uh, concerns are unfounded. He must be taken seriously, I'm sure. But I thought I'd say that anyway for the record. Thank you, sir. Kollege Golnisch. Thank you, Mr. Golnisch. I'd like to propose that we continue with Mr. Salevsky now, and then we'll have a round of replies, after which we'll give the floor, give the floor to the floor again. Kollege Salevsky. <laughs> First of all, thank you very much for organizing of this uh, uh, meeting and opportunity to discuss uh, Ukrainian elections, uh, which are, uh, I, I believe, on the top list of interests of those who interest in uh, uh, European neighborhood policy, uh, because uh, the most important country within the, the scope of uh, European neighborhood policy is Ukraine. That is clear for everybody. And, of course, we observe the situation in this country with a mix of, mixture of uh, hope and, uh, and, as a matter of fact, of threat. And uh, uh, these elections uh, were important for us to understand uh, in which direction Ukraine uh, will go. Uh, what was the real threat was that uh, the scale of falsifications would lead to acquire uh, by uh, regions party, constitutional majority. What didn't happen, fortunately, because it would be a huge, uh, let's say, violation against uh, uh, the, the, the will of, uh, of Ukrainians. And uh, I want to say that uh, everybody uh, who observed the elections, uh, and there was a need, it was not needed to, to, to be uh, a, a, a member of European observation mission or uh, to be there personally but, but who read about it uh, uh, understands a huge scale of irregularities during the campaign and understand also the important scale of falsifications of elections and that is something clear for everybody and nobody can claim that uh, these elections uh, matched OEC standards. But on the other hand side, because uh, uh, we can compare uh, the results of exit polls with the uh, uh, result of the election, uh, uh, we cannot say also, and must, nobody must say, that this election does not reflect the will of uh, Ukrainian public opinion. So we can say that these elections didn't match the standards but in overall result, they reflect the opinion of Ukrainians. And this is something what we in European Union have to acknowledge and have to respect. And it is the basis for us to continue our cooperation with Svierhovna Rada. Uh, that is first opinion. Second opinion is that, um, or this is a question as a matter of fact, uh, that the issue we discuss right now, which are the consequences for EU-Ukraine relations of these elections. And of course we observe the process of uh, uh, constitution of uh, Vyrhovna Rada. We know that the first meeting will be the, the 17th of December, right? So it will be quite, quite soon. And of course we observe uh, the process of uh, division of power within Vyrhovna Rada. We hope that uh, the opposition will get according to the status of Yerhovna Rada, it's part of the power uh, and uh, it is extremely important for us that uh, it will be a division between the committee, the com committee's chairman according to the proportion of the, 
uh, of, the, of the parties uh, according to the elections, and so on and so on. Uh, and that is the other stage for us important, that uh, so elections are, are, are passed, so we observe what will happen with uh, this five constituencies, but then what will happen in the process of constitution of Virhovna Rada, that uh, uh, what will be the role of the opposition. Then I would like to come to the conclusion uh, uh, by asking Mr. Senchenko. Do you think, Mr. Senchenko, as representative of Batkivshina, that uh, after this election there is a political need, political climate, political opportunity to sign up the association agreement with the CFTA? If yes, do you think that it should be conditional or not? If conditional, which conditions you foresee for that? Thank you. Angesichts der Day in mind that we've got to keep an eye on the clock. I will take two more MEPs, after which I propose our panelists will do, do the field the questions. We have to wind up at eight o'clock. Mr. Stockton, and then. Uh, yes, thank you very much, A. Wolf, and thank you for organizing this. Uh, when I was asked by the European analysis. Uh, Mateus is uh, also here, um, to go to the Ukraine to observe the mission. Um, I didn't know anything about the Ukraine. So I had my assistants provide a book work, and I, I think now I know more about Ukraine than the average Ukrainian. But, um, but, but that's a, that was a good start. And first of all, I was very impressed by how nice people are, how beautiful the country is. But then it comes down to the elections. And I always think that we are there really as observers, and not as much as deciders. I mean, I think my job there is to see in the, in the poll stations that I go if they live up to the rules. Uh, if, I, uh, if I look on the street, if I see people campaigning on the wrong way, that's your job as an observer. So I took that very high. So we went to the polling stations, and uh, I really did see some, some things with problems. For instance, uh, the secrecy of the ballot boxes, they were fully transparent. And I think that should be changed because you could really see what people uh, had voted. You could just see it. But I heard that there was a large discussion about that in the Euro Ukraine beforehand, so they decided for this. But on the other hand, and we also mentioned that when we uh, gave a press conference there, that people really didn't seem to mind. They, they were not in fear of pro providing their vote. People knew. Um, um, they knew that their votes um, could not be used against them. At least that's true in the polling stations that we visited. Um, I also had a problem with, and I think that, uh, let's see, Mr. Senchenko, he also mentioned it, it's the, it's the boxes they take to, to the homes of people. When people are elderly or they're not be able to go to the, to the polling booths, uh, someone is uh, together with police, is going uh, by them and getting the votes. I think that's a too fraudulent system, and so. But and I, I think something should be changed about that. And there was one polling station in which um, uh, there was the, the issue that the people who are basically giving out the, the votes, uh, uh, what do you call the, the voting bills, um, they could look right into the booth itself, and it was. It was not. It was transparent, so that was not a good thing. I mean, th there was no freedom of voting, and I think that was very wrong in that place. And I think that the acting uh, chair should be should have done something about it, but she didn't because of strict regulations. But I think that they sh should get the opportunity to, to at those certain times to to, um, to change the situation at the polling stations without fear of reprisal, because. This clearly wasn't very good, but once again, people didn't seem to mind. And when it comes to the other different uh, issues already raised, which went wrong in the elections, um, like I said, I'm only judging the things that I have seen. And of course, it's never good when police comes uh, attacking uh, voting uh, stations. And I had another question to Mr. Senchenko, because you were mentioning, um, you were mentioning 
uh, 34 polling stations that had problems. And um, what I was wondering is, um, uh, 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 were, was it always in the benefit of the, of the, uh, of the coalition parties, or was it in, also sometimes in the benefit of the, um, of, of the opposition parties? Because, I mean, if it happens a bit evenly, I mean, so I, those are my questions uh, to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Dear colleague, now Mr. Griffin, please. Yes, uh, thank you. Nick Griffin, MEP, and I was an observer at these elections. Um, I saw at those democratic, well-organized, and very relaxed elections, uh, not perfect, but far better and far more democratic and fair than those that we see in the United Kingdom. I'd like to address my first point to Mr. Sinchenko. Um, incidentally, when you speak of judicial neglect, uh, manipulation of public opinion, people being threatened with their jobs, uh, I hear you talking about Britain as well as Ukraine. Uh, so you're already pretty integrated. If you want to go the whole distance, you also need to, threat to threaten to throw people from their homes if they vote the wrong way. We get that in Britain. Uh, but um, rather more seriously, I was interested when you spoke and showed the falsified uh, application for voting from home um, in that, although clearly it's wrong, is this an issue of corruption or is this lazy voters? Because it seems to me that these are genuine voters and it's likely they would vote the same way at home or in the polling station. Uh, again, it's, it's a problem, but a small problem compared, say, to Britain when we have two million completely fictitious, invented voters, all of them with postal votes. So it appears your system isn't good, but it's better than ours. Uh, and the second question I'd like to address uh, to Mr. Piskorski, uh, this question of the mobile phones being used to photograph people's ballot papers, uh, which I did hear about um, while I was in Ukraine, uh, I think this is a problem which is going to spread to every democratic country, not just Ukraine. Uh, and I'd like to ask you, as you're an expert in elections, have you thought about this, and how do you think it can best be stopped? Thank you. And, uh, and I think it's uh, fair to, to uh, continue with uh, Matthäus and then uh, you, uh, Mr. Uh, Koshara, and, uh, and you are the, the, the coronation, Mr. Uh, Bondarenko. Please, Mr. Shinchenko. I'd like to answer to Mr. Garmisch's questions. The list on the national, le on the national level and the majority of candidates were just uh, going in one round. That is the law now. Bulgarian uh, MP raised the issue of imperfections in law and, and the constitution law. I support your opinion that to extend turn the parliamentary mandate beyond the term it was elected for is not good but what we're talking about when we talk about the illegitimacy of the parliament we're not talking about that we're talking about the constitution that was approved by the constitutional court not the parliament that was during Kuchma's presidency and that is actually in the constitution itself that the parliament should approve it Mr. Zalewski's question with regard to the association agreement and the FTA. Of course, for us, it's the most important issue for us because I may repeat myself, but these are not just manipulative terms, but in reality, it's a choice of the majority of our country. But this is the question we have to answer, find answers both in Ukraine and we have to find the solutions in Ukraine and to, we have to change the situation in Ukraine and these are the questions we have to find answers here in Europe as well I do not think and you know we are the proponents of Ukraine integrating into Europe as soon as possible but at the same time I don't think that Europe is ready to forego the democratic principles the standards that it stands for that became the norm of life in the European countries and for us, the, therefore, the issue is when we are able, and I'm sure we will be, when we're able 
to join those uh, values then so that Ukraine would look attractive I think today's authorities in Ukraine are not interested in the European integration equally as it's not interested in rapprochement with the Russian Federation because what is considered to be a value for the regime, the elite that r runs the country now they distribute national treasures, national budget uh, without any restrictions and they do not need any critics both, uh, either from the Europe who n nor uh, or any participants from the Russian side in this process of distribution so no, I think this current situation neither here nor there actually matches what the Ukrainian authorities want to have with regard to what we need to do and how we can move forward in my opinion the Ukrainian, authority, Ukrainian authorities are what we have now but tomorrow it will be different but there are citizens who want to live differently and who believe that the standards that Europe offers has to offer are the standards that are, that are attractive and one has to strive to achieve them inside the country and it's important in my opinion that beside the Ukrainian, author besides the Ukrainian authorities that there were other conversations uh, going on on a variety of levels citizens to citizens, business to business, small and medium business, youth programs, uh, mobility programs, educational programs and scientific research programs etc etc so all that it, although it may not be officially acknowledged yet uh, but by any agreements, official agree agreements on the authorities level but those are going to be the steps towards a fully fledged European integration of the country Mr. Wunderstab raised the issue with regard to those 35 constituencies which we believe had significant distortions of the results on majoritarian principle but we've never heard about any constitu constituencies where the authorities would have any claims against the opposition we didn't have any claims against opposition parties with all to respect that these are three opposition parties fighting to get ahead but we did not come we, we did come to the we did come to the conclusion that we have one common value to get the country back on democratic track and in, in a variety of aspects and therefore we came to a single strategy si single opinion to to go towards this objective and therefore there were no contradictions between us in this regard a few words with regard to the law that issue was also raised uh, by a number of colleagues here to what extent is perfect uh, un undoubtedly it has to be improved and this v voting outside of the polling stations definitely it's a clear path to falsifications but I'd like to say that when election commissions actually took a liberty of advising those old older people how to vote and so the situation when they were told what who to vote for Ukraine actually has been there it was 15 years ago nobody goes these days to those people now they just go to the nearest house where this team that has the input from those allegedly people voting at home they just simply fill out the ballots and then just come back and say here are the ballots and it becomes, it's become more cynical and more pragmatic as far as the flaws in the law, the key flaws are the issue of the mixed election system as a minority we did not have enough political strength to counteract uh, the process of bringing that old system into our elections process but I'd like to mention the, uh, something else I don't know as, an, as a legislator what legislative law we should introduce that would ban special police right forces to stomp 
polling station. I don't know what we should write, should put into the law to ban the authorities to rewrite the final uh, minutes of the election commissions, put a stamp to it with f fully aware, fully being aware that the political opponents would have the same uh, balance that were officially published by the by the by the government and numbered etc. But the authorities did not seem to be afraid to change that situation. I don't know what we can do about it. How we can just introduce this into the law so we could avoid that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, when it comes to the question of uh, Mr. Griffin, I'm. From what I know, uh, no electoral system in the world is perfect. And from what I know, no political culture in uh, the world is perfect. I mean, uh, no political culture is free, on, free of corruption. Uh, when it comes to the mobile phones or uh, photo cameras which uh, are taken to the cabins at the polling stations just to prove how one has voted and then perhaps get some gratification for such uh, voting. I think uh, we cannot solve this problem unless we put uh, on the entrance to the polling station some uh, security system, uh, some security check control as uh, at the airport, for instance. So uh, I fear it would be impossible uh, to fight this practice and uh, I'm sure that uh, this might be a uh, fault only by, let's say, working on one's political culture, on the uh, country's political culture. Perhaps it could be also fought by uh, improving the level of life and social uh, system, and then people would not be eager to be corrupted by uh, the candidates. But again, I would, I would like to state here that and the same was in several other countries and the same things happened in Poland, for instance, when we had uh, regional elections or elections of uh, city mayors. Uh, the majoritarian system is usually more, let's say, um, vulnerable for such practices, when it comes to such practices, than the proportional one. That's, that's my opinion after observing the elections in uh, several countries. So that's, of course, a problem we, we cannot solve, I think. Uh, well, when it comes to, uh, to the whole uh, discussion, I would just have one short remark. Uh, as uh, Mr. Zalewski uh, told, uh, regardless of all remarks made here, regardless of all remarks made uh, by the opposition, by all the participants of the elections, uh, the, the elections, I mean the result, reflects most, not only of the exit polls, but of the opinion polls which were made before, I mean uh, mm. several weeks before the elections, as the electoral war, uh, law prohibits uh, uh, opinion polls, uh, from what I remember, uh, two weeks before the election day. Uh, so, uh, when it comes to the possibility of the people to uh, choose their representatives when it comes to um, the fact that they, the elections reflect the opinions of uh, the Ukrainian citizens. I don't have any doubts. And I'm also glad that even the most radical opposition parties like, for instance, we mentioned here uh, Svoboda, the right-wing uh, radical party, uh, are accepting or recognizing the election results because otherwise we could get a situation which we have now or had in, um, for several days in uh, one of the European Union member countries, I mean Lithuania, uh, we would have a paralyzed and blocked uh, political system which uh, uh, I wouldn't wish uh, would happen in Ukraine. Thank you. Thank you. Microphone, please. I'll answer also the questions of Mr. Golnisch uh, of this uh, system between mm -hmm. this, uh, okay. uh, how to elect mm -hmm. the, the, okay. the, these 225 uh, okay. mandates. Thank you. 
So, uh, unfortunately, uh, Mr. Stoyanov left. So, but uh, who knows him uh, may say uh, to him that I will pass his best regards to Mr. Kissa, who's been re-elected in, in the Odessa region. And uh, there will be another election soon because Mr. Kissa uh, was uh, a member of the Odessa regional legislature and uh, there will be another election. What regards uh, uh, Mr. Stoyano mentioned lottery as a very negative example. Uh, so I would say uh, that uh, not more than 20 party, parties participated in the elections, but 87 parties, mm. including on the le local le level. Yes, but what's important here, that parties who, uh, which are already in the parliament, they uh, had their own quotas in all commissions of all level. It means that only new parties didn't have their quotas. Mm -hmm. and, but when uh, the Central Election Commission faced uh, that 87 parties are going to participate, what should they do? First of all, they use the law. And this system of lottery is prescribed by the law in Ukraine. And the law, and it, uh, as it was said here, was adopted with the overwhelming majority in the Rada. All parties voted for the law. And of course, the lottery is not the best way, but this is the most just way mm -hmm. how to identify members. Uh, can you imagine a small room somewhere in a small village of Ukraine that all 87 parties can send their representatives to the Commission. That's simply technically impossible. Uh, uh, I would also uh, like to respond to Mr. Golnish, who uh, made him his comments on the mix system. Uh, I would say uh, that, to my mind, the, uh, the mix system uh, reflects more the interests of the people of Ukraine that the straightly proportional system. Why? Here is uh, my example, for example. Uh, I, uh, uh, in my party, I am in charge of uh, foreign relations, and I am a foreign uh, relations speaker on behalf of the party of regions, and unfortunately, I visit Brussels more than, uh, than my constituency. And uh, when we had straightly proportional system, so it was quite clear that regional uh, interests are not fully observed in the Rada. And this proportion of uh, regional representations in the Rada was also very clear. For example, in my party, the proportion of people from uh, two or three Eastern Ukrainian oblasts are very big. So, for example, uh, in my, f uh, in my uh, political group, out of uh, 172 originally elected members to the group, around 70 members were from the Donetsk, mm -hmm. city of Donetsk and from the Donetsk region. That's why I am absolutely clear that the mix system more reflects the regional interests and the interests of the people of Ukraine. And today Ukraine is working on a new constitution. And the president of Ukraine has called for a meeting of the Constitutional Assembly. We hope that the opposition will participate in the work of the Constitutional Assembly and Ukraine will have the constitution which fits most the interests of the people of Ukraine. But what the question was... Uh, yes, and uh, national or regional yes. party list. That's quite clear. And uh, it, it's written in the law that we have uh, national party lists. And, uh, the whole nation is, is uh, one Yes, one, one election one district election is the whole nation. Yes. 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 yes, 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 yes. Uh, I would like 
to respond also to Mr. Zalewski, who left the room, unfortunately. So I think uh, he made more political statements uh, here, and uh, unfortunately uh, he s uh, said a uh, few words uh, and uh, like uh, uh, he mentioned that uh, Ukrainian and Ukrainian elections may be a threat to what? Uh, to the European Union or to Poland. But uh, I promise Mr. Zalewski that I will take seriously his words because Ukraine before never uh, took Poland as a threat to Ukraine. And uh, I understand uh, Mr. Zalewski's political affiliation and Actually, for many of his party fellows, it was not uh, actually important what or whom Ukrainian people will elect, but uh, what will happen to Yuli Tymoshenko, who is in prison. And uh, to my mind, that also indicates a positive side of the story. Why? Because Ukraine uh, is quite integrated now, because Ukrainian... Uh, political parties uh, have their assisted parties in the European mm -hmm. Union, mm -hmm. and uh, sure, yes. three of them from the opposition are affiliates to the European mm -hmm. People's Party, and that's why Mr. Zalewski says that uh, if the opposition doesn't win, it may be a threat. And I will pass uh, his statement to my also party fellows and we'll discuss who is the th threat and to what. Yes, uh, I would also uh, would like to respond to Mr. Van der Stube, uh, who said about transparent boxes. Once we had non-transparent boxes, but uh, uh, we had some unfortunate cases when many ballots were put in a pack and thrown into non-transparent boxes. That's why we decided that everything is transparent and uh, observers, the Commission, know uh, how many ballots uh, people are putting into the ballot box. May, may I? I think it's a, it's a, it's a mistake. It's, it's a mistranslation. Maybe it, it, it was it wasn't uh, the box itself. It was the how, how do you call it in English? In French, l'isoloir. That is the, the the place. Booth. Prepare their ballot. So that should be that should yeah, be here. Uh, I the, the cabins. The cab yes. cabins. Yes. So uh, if there were a sort of transparent cabins, it's a straight violation of the law. Mm. That's quite sure. Can I, can I clarify that? Yes, yes. I was at the polling station in question uh, with Mr. van der Stoep, uh, so there were two issues. He was concerned that the ballot boxes themselves are clear and see-through, but also at one station uh, where the people handing out the ballots were sitting was looking into the, uh, where people were voting, and it wasn't properly covered. So, but uh, have you seen uh, any curtains on the cabin? So maybe uh, some uh, uh, a voting person didn't uh, shut the curtains. There were curtains, but they were virtually transparent. Having said which, as Mr. Van Schoep said, we watched and nobody seemed to care. Mm -hmm. So it's a technical flaw rather than actually than an issue of potential corruption or, or abuse. But it was a single observation. It was one single place. And they, they say it was because of the shape of the room yeah. and they had no alternative. It wasn't regular. It wasn't a, it wasn't a regular thing, yeah. no. Okay. Uh, so, but uh, if uh, the uh, voting process was transparent, uh, <laughs> to the extent that it was a transparent, uh, people could see how people uh, voted, so it's a violation. It's too much transparency. Yes, yes, yeah, too much. <laughs> So, uh, about uh, home voting, uh, so according to official uh, uh, data, 2.7% uh, uh, use their right for home voting in Ukraine. It is less than in, uh, in the elections of 2007 and 2006. I cannot 
recall now exact, exact figures uh, of the previous elections, but uh, uh, in 2007 and 2006 we had around 4% of home votings. This time 2.7. And uh, I don't think uh, those home votings make any case uh, and influence the overall result of the elections. So I think this is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. And now, last one, Mr. Oleg Bondarenko, please. Vielen Dank noch einmal, Herr Stadler, für die Möglichkeit zu diskutieren über die Ukraine in der in Europäischen Parlament. Was uh, heißt das Wort? Ich habe mir ein paar Punkte gesagt. 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 Ich habe такие замечания, что, например, семья идет и как раз вот сейчас говорили про кабинки для голосования, и семья вместе заходит в эти кабинки и голосует. А с одной стороны, это нарушение, потому что муж влияет на выбор жены, жена на выбор мужа и на выбор ребенка. Да? Но с другой стороны, в Украине, где есть, безусловно, традиционное общество, это вряд ли можно признать серьезным нарушением. Хотя формально это нарушение. А второй очень интересный момент по поводу того, кому идут на пользу фальсификации. Вы знаете, сложно говорить сейчас, хотя, безусловно, по ряду округов я не исключаю того, что были взаимные фальсификации, да? не только со стороны партии власти, но и со стороны оппозиции. И нужно понимать, что такое партия власти в украинских реалиях, где западная Украина фактически находится под руководством наиболее радикальной партии, оппозиционной партии Украины, партии Свободы, где Тернополь, Львов, Ивано-Франковск, практически абсолютное большинство этой партии имеет в городских собраниях. Так вот, кто в этих ситуациях власти, кто оппозиция? Да? Это тоже хороший вопрос. И, знаете, на выборах 2010 года, местных локальных выборах, там были зафиксированы разные случаи фальсификации, они были взаимны. Да? Если на Востоке эти фальсификации могли иметь характер провластный, а, ну, про власть они и там, и там, да? только власть в одном случае партия регионов, в другом случае это оппозиция. А, спасибо вам большое, господин Гольмиш, за вопрос по поводу двух туровых выборов по одномандатным округам. Этот французский опыт, безусловно, заслуживает особого внимания и интереса. И в условиях Украины, возможно, он может быть теоретически актуален а, по причине того, что в двух туровых выборах а, Существует некая, так скажем, страховка, страховка от победы радикалов. И если, например, в Киеве в одном округе... I'm sorry, but if people vote for the radicals, I am supposed to be a radical. If you are a democrat, radicals should, should have their place. Sorry. I say, I say, I, I'm supposed to be a radical for, for, for uh, 25 years in this parliament, okay? If you are a democrat and if people vote for the radicals, the radicals should be represented. I don't like, for example, the extreme left or not the communists, but if people vote for them, they should, be, have, the, they should have their place in the parliament. Mr. Stadler is supposed to be a radical, too. Sometimes. Well, he has his place in the Euro Austrian parliament. And if the purpose of a, I'm sorry to, to if, if the purpose of a system is just to evacuate the people who are non-politically correct, this cannot be called democracy. Спасибо вам большое, но я здесь не хотел бы спорить. Я понимаю, что есть радикалы и радикалы. Разные. А, а в принципе, если говорить об угрозах для молодой демократии, которая, безусловно, Украина является, то а, главной проблемой, на мой взгляд, остается то, что вопрос, кто сядет а, в случае прихода следующей новой власти, он до сих пор остается актуальным. И а, не стоит забывать о том, что в 2005 году, после победы оранжевой революции Виктора Ющенко, было огромное количество уголовных и далеко не всегда справедливых и правовых преследований представителей партии регионов. 
Я не являюсь сторонником либо с течениями партии регионов, но ради справедливости нужно напомнить о том, что огромное количество депутатов и политиков партии регионов тогда, в 2005 году, имели большие проблемы. И эти проблемы носили скорее не правовой характер, а политический характер. Так вот, главная проблема, на мой взгляд, для Украины, которая остается на сегодняшний день, это когда в условиях отсутствия такой проработанной, детализированной правовой базы, продолжает действовать принцип принятия решений, основанный на понятийной, а не правовой логике. И э, вполне э, теоретически можно допускать, что в случае победы тех сил, которые на сегодняшний момент являются оппозицией, определенными неправовыми преследованиями подвергнутся все силы, которые сегодня находятся в области. Это проблема, и ее нужно решать как-то совместно усилия. Спасибо. Für die hochinteressanten und sehr, sehr lebhaften Debattenbeiträge. Ich glaube, als Resümee können wir schon sagen, die Ukraine ist grundsätzlich auf einem demokratischen Weg. Die Ukraine ist ein unglaublich wichtiger Partner für uns in der Europäischen Union, aber auch für die äh, einzelnen Mitgliedsländer der Europäischen Union. Wir sind davon überzeugt, und hier teile ich die Einschätzung des Kollegen Zalewski, dass das Wahlergebnis, so wie das Parlament jetzt zusammensetzt ist, und das ist für die Demokraten das Wichtigste, den Willen der ukrainischen, des ukrainischen Volkes wiedergibt, widerspiegelt. Das ist das Bedeutendste und Wichtigste für den, aus dem, äh, vor dem Hintergrund des Aspektes der Legitimität. Und wir meinen, dass die politische Kultur in jedem Land verbesserungswürdig ist, auch in der Ukraine, und dass sich das auch entwickeln wird. In diesem Sinne, meine, da, meine Herren, meine Herrenrunde hier, meine Herren, äh, darf ich Ihnen danken für Ihre Diskussionsbeiträge für Ihr Kommen. Ich darf Ihnen in diesem Sinne auch alles Gute für Ihre weitere Entwicklung wünschen, für die Entwicklung der Ukraine. Sie ist für uns, wie gesagt, auch von besonderer Bedeutung. Ich darf allen danken, die so lange ausgeahnt haben. Wir haben jetzt fast etwas mehr als zwei Stunden hier diskutiert und Diskussionsbeiträge gehört. Ich darf Sie nunmehr äh, noch einladen zu einem Cocktail hier im Anschluss an diese Veranstaltung und wünsche Ihnen noch einen schönen Abend und alles Gute.